So we have some time for questions um, for Lucy Genoa or Doug. Yes. For Dr. Bloomberg. I see you have a, uh, a disclaimer, but were any of the images graphic, too graphic or shocking? Did anybody push the envelope and how did you deal with that? No. They all played nice. <laughs> they they all said nice. No one said, I'm going to surprise this professor. <laughs> No. Okay. I don't know if that's because the display went there. Yeah, <laughs> but now nobody did anything. I'm going to change everything in my world. Yes. Um, I have a question for both about the um, debate, which I really liked it very much. Um, did you think that the reaction to thought and things about, um, about what you think it is and kind of the genre and work with what? work with external noises, you think that they're familiar with the um, TV and kind of things? No, I didn't. Um, what I gave him was I gave him some example um, writing about that that I had developed around a topic that we didn't cover. So I, I tried to make sure it was something that, that they wouldn't just think that I did, you know, in post it. Um, but that's all I did. I, I, I just gave them those examples and said, this is what I want you to do. And most of them seem to get it. I'm just wondering whether there's a value to having them engaging kind of beyond the scope of the classroom with what that means. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I try not to play off too much um, with this one, but yeah, I, I think I think going forward, that that would be a, a, a very good idea to, to get them sort of in that mindset. I mean, I also thought it might be a good idea to maybe start that actually earlier and do that for other topics as well as other topics. But then again, I don't want to yeah. <laughs> so. okay. I have a comment from Dr. Little, Littlewood, sorry. Uh, first, go Tars. Oh. Um, <laughs> <Nice>. uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to say I, I started, uh, or I sat through your presentation with skepticism at first. I was like, ah, selfies. Oh, mm -hmm. I can get rid of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I love your idea. Oh, um, nice. And I actually can think of ways that I could incorporate it. And I wonder if. Uh, the beauty of selfies is that it makes the teenagers go, all right, like she, she's speaking our language. But then to talk about the comment about it not being academic, I wonder if photography or visual expression or if there's a way, and it might be that you're trying to reach that audience by using the term selfie, but looking through your examples, it looks like it's actually not selfies. It seems like a lot of them are being representative objects. <coughs> and, uh, so it might be a way that you could make it a little more accessible yet it's academic. Yeah, definitely. As interestingly, a lot of them chose not to use the selfie format. And then the assignment description, I said, you don't have to. And my reasoning for that was I didn't want to make anybody who didn't want to show their face or their body feel uncomfortable, you know. So I, so I was so married to the term because it is in our general education curriculum and the particular, quote, neighborhood that this class is housed in is self and community. And it's IMW, which is mirrors and windows. What do we see when we look in the mirror? What do we see when we look out the window? So I was trying to, I just fell in love with the idea. <laughs> but I totally see what you mean about maybe, Kurt Vonnegut said you gotta have the guts to cut if it's not working. So maybe that's true, I don't know. But I, I definitely appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I see a, a thank you so much for these presentations. There's so many connections between them. Um, I, I see particular connections between uh, Professor Harvey and Professor Littler's work. Um, Professor Littler, you mentioned um, how that, that comment about not being academic enough, you know, and about um, wanting to use the post on each other's comments. And I like how you started out by uh, checking that impulse to be self congratulatory. You know, we do this already in the humanities, and I even hope I don't really this way. Uh, and Professor Harvey, you were still talking about wanting to get the debate more in, in, in class. Uh, so what, where I'm seeing the connection, I'm curious to see your comments on this, is that those kinds of things you're addressing for like higher order learning. Mm -hmm. um, so when students are trying to write these Instagram things, maybe they're picking up that there's something more that they're supposed to get out of that kind of work. Um, and maybe that's the work that they actually want to do in class with each other. Maybe mm -hmm. that's where they want you as, a, as an expert mentor to guide them on, on what it means to write critically or think critically, uh, or what you mean by writing critically. Maybe that's where the debate comes from. So I'm curious to see, like, maybe you can dialogue on that, the strength of the teaching that higher order learning more intentionally. Yeah, I, I, I think that's my alignment. Um, I think that's, 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 I think that's,
So, you know, are they really getting to the higher level of faith? And, you know, I, I thought it was interesting the synchronous one. I really thought they did. But then again, I was there. And I could you know, support it and, and you know, guide it. And, um, and so I do think I do think there's a value there in, in terms of trying to relate to the value behind them in the class and face to face and being able to do that in real time. Because um, the tools just aren't there to do it very well in real time. Um, but I'm not an expert. Um, as far as a higher order thinking, yes, I think so. And I was surprised that it kind of worked <laughs> in ways that I wasn't expecting. You know, I was really genuinely impressed with the work they were doing, and not just a few of them, not just a few of the best students, but across the board. I was impressed with how I did see them start to make connections between a novel written in 1954 and their own 2015 life. You know, um, as far as bringing that into the classroom, showing the image on the screen using those terms that they created as part of the definition, I think definitely carried that over into a kind of living, breathing thing in the classroom space. Um, I think I need to do it more. Because like I mentioned in the talk, I, I do have my own agenda, and there's things that I want to cover, and it's a 50-minute class three times a week, and sometimes Instagram went to the back burner. So I'm, I am looking for ways that I can continue to make it more central without losing that balance of making sure that they know some of the things I think they kind of need to know, you know? Maybe online debate, I don't know, maybe... I just thought it was very interesting to her, like that idea of taking their Instagram posting and turning it into text. Do you think that would work? Do you think it would work? I think so. I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe some other people in our room, you know, but I, I, I know there are people that have done work in that area. Right. You know, that are, Said, you know, they could pull together postings and turn it into like a text. Like, yeah. yeah, and I would think that that would be the ideal way to do that. But okay. I don't know. Maybe, Maybe this is for all three that have been mentioned about some of this. Um, yeah, I, I think we often benefit from some of the emergent kind of behaviors and contributions students make when they do these activities. But I, I think that's kind of a an ad hoc benefit. I think what we're trying to get at is how to align these approaches and assignments with, you know, kind of robust learning outcomes and goals that we have for our content. And so I'm wondering how, having gone through several iterations or maybe think about the next, you know, just starting to think about these efforts as developmental, you know, and, and that might fold into revisioning and some of the other things that do have kind of some pedagogical depth that's visible to students. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are, you know, summer, I, we're teaching the course again in the fall. Um, so summer affords the opportunity to again turn back to the assignment, understand where it was effective and, and where, where it was less effective than we thought it was going to be. Because the tool, I mean, just to reiterate, I think something you commented upon, the tools themselves don't make it happen. It's the context in which we're embedding them within, it's the practices we're hoping to foster with them. But students don't arrive at a Google Doc and think, here is how I am going to, um, plan and structure and pace my research. In fact, a byproduct of using the Google Doc that Jen and I realized this last time, and that we're going to be transparent about next time, is that the whole revision history is there. And so it's, it's I mean, it is a revision history. It doesn't tell the whole story. But it certainly tells us some important elements to the story of how they use the Google Doc as a tool. And we kind of stumbled into that last semester as we were making sense of um, some, some kind of last minute work that students were doing. And then we realized, well, we've got this evidence, a certain kind of evidence, and but can we use it? Because we didn't, we didn't lay bare at the outset. And students, we have your revision history here, and that's going to count towards your pacing grade. But, so one of the things we're going to consider this summer is how do we want to make that transparent with students and 
and, and how do we account for things like, well, just because Jen's name doesn't appear on the Google Doc until week three doesn't mean we weren't seated side by side working with Google, working on the Google Doc together. So, so even the analytics that Google provides aren't foolproof. Um, so I, I think that you know that bl I mean blended learn getting blended learning right or better is difficult because it is emerging. It's emerging as we're doing it, and not only are we learning more each time we use it. The students are also changing in their use of these emergent tools semester by semester. Um, just to continue on with the Google Docs issue, um, the, can you explain why? I saw that one student put up there that she had so many tabs open, usually that makes her very anxious. When I, when I have my students also do research and then in the class we, we started in the class where everybody has their own device. Everybody starts their and then their research and then I send them away and then when they come back the next time they need to have a number of sources. Um, students do have a lot of anxiety when they know that they're being evaluated on the quality of their, their sources and they do say things like I was going from document to document to document and I, I just got totally overwhelmed. So why was Google Docs so helpful to that student as opposed to any other uh, word processing document or any other way of tracking the research? I think that's a really good question. And, and part of what I understand in, in reading Tessa's journal over the semester is that um, it was a public document. So it was helpful in that she had feedback from her partner and she had feedback from us, um, and and that in having to organize that much material to share it with others who were part of her process, um, it was useful. 